Today I'm joined by Chicago historian Julius Jones at the 29th Street Beach to discuss and introduce the choral work, A Stone to the Head, The Death of Eugene Williams. So thank you, uh, Dr. Jones. To bring us back to the summer, that hot, hot summer of, 20, uh, of 1919, can you give us a overview of that time and place us squarely in 1919? Yes, so America had just successfully won what was then known as the Great War. We now refer to it as World War I. Um, and they had successfully won that war for democracy. And so they believed that democracy around the world had been saved. And as part of that, Americans of all races and ethnicities had fought to help win that war for democracy, including African Americans. So now that that war has been won, those same African Americans are returning to the United States in cities like Chicago, um, looking to actualize some democracy for themselves in their own country. And that assertiveness um, was seen as a potential threat to the United States and the racial order of the time, which was still uh, segregated, um, deeply segregated. And so many white um, Americans had deep fears and concerns that these new assertive um, African Americans who had learned to uh, fight and had actually done so with great heroism and valor would use that uh, military training, that aggressiveness to potentially, uh, you know, be violent in their request and their demands for equality. And so this anxiety was really running through the country. Many people felt that this uh, aggressiveness on the part of African Americans was actually part of a deeper subversive plot um, uh, where they were sort of being put up to this by foreign influences. You also have anxiety around economic competition. You have servicemen coming back to the United States where there are simply not enough jobs for everyone. And many people believe that racialized preferences should be used to give whites jobs over blacks. And finally, you have housing segregation. There's a need for more housing um, in cities like Chicago, and many people um, resent um, the specter of having to live um, in communities alongside African Americans. So all of these tensions and anxieties really are turning cities like Chicago into racial powder cakes. So Chicago is certainly not unique in, uh, in that space in 1919. Um, can you tell us a bit more specifically of what happened in Chicago, what happened to the young man named Eugene Williams. Yes, I often say that Eugene's murder was the spark that lit the powder keg. So on that uh, Sunday, July 27th, 1919, it was very hot in Chicago, very hot and very humid. And this was well before um, air conditioning. So the best and really the only course of action to escape the heat was to come to Lake Michigan. In fact, that day, the Tribune told Chicagoans that there was enough room for a quarter of a million Chicagoans to come to the shores of Lake Michigan. And so that's what Eugene and four of his friends did. Um, and at the time, there was an invisible a racialized boundary that separated the 26th Street Beach, which was for African Americans, and the 29th Street Beach, which were for whites. And so Eugene and his friends, they built a makeshift raft, and that raft sort of inadvertently crossed that uh, invisible racial boundary. And as a result, um, a young man named George Schubert began um, throwing rocks at them. And one of those rocks struck Eugene in the head, and he drowned. When Eugene drowned and his body was ultimately recovered, uh, there was a uh, demand that um, the person responsible be arrested and brought to um, account for this. And a white police officer refused to do so and refused to allow a black police officer to arrest um, the assailant as well. As a result, that leads to news spreading throughout the city about this death and about the refusal of law enforcement to hold the person responsible accountable. That leads to a large congregating um, here at, at the beach and many people begin to believe that um, 
the African Americans are going to seek revenge. And so you have these sensationalized stories of African Americans looking um, for um, whites to kill, to harm as sort of a revenge for Eugene Williams' killing. None of this was true, but these sensationalized accounts gave um, credence to some fears that already existed. And so then you have white groups who begin to um, begin attacking African Americans. Some people refer to these groups as athletic clubs, other people refer to them as gangs, but they sort of lead to the significant sort of convulsion of racialized violence that begins to happen. And over the next eight days, you see, you know, beatings and murders and and bombings and, and fires set and homes sort of ran ransacked all throughout um, you know this south side area from the sh lake shore all the way to the back of the yards neighborhood some several miles uh, to the west and how did the city respond to the riot and you said there were eight days full of these violent activities um, what happened at the end of those eight days well the city tried to respond but essentially was unable to control the violence um, and so the National Guard had to be called in um, additionally we saw very soon that the city was uh, disproportionately targeting African Americans for punishment so even though African Americans were the disproportionate victims of the crimes the people brought to trial uh, to be held accountable for the riot were disproportionately African American as well so we sort of saw this uh, racialized injustice and even sort of dealing with um, stopping the riot and holding anyone accountable for it and what in the end happened to Eugene's killer Eugene's killer was ultimately arrested and charged for involuntary manslaughter, but he was ultimately acquitted um, and found not guilty of that crime. I think to all of us uh, sitting at home and to those who contributed their voice to this choral piece to singing about Eugene's death, um, while it happened, Eugene's story happened a hundred years ago, to a lot of us seeing the news today, it seemed like many Eugenes died uh, yeah. to no avail and not a lot of things has happened yeah. since then. What lessons can we learn from the death of Eugene Williams and the riots and the activities that happened thereafter? Well, I think the first lesson to learn is the need for you know, expedient uh, justice and accountability. We could imagine if the young man who was responsible for Eugene's death had been promptly arrested, that you could have avoided a great deal of the violence that ultimately happened. The other uh, lesson is, I think, a lesson that was mislearned in the response to the riot, and that was that the best course of action, rather than address some of these systemic issues um, of inequalities and also fears and anxieties, that instead the best course of action was to keep people separated, to separate uh, Chicago um, by race and by ethnicity. And I think that's a lesson that was mislearned. I think we need to learn how to live together in equality quality and justice for each and every uh, person here in the United States. And that's the lesson that I think we still have to learn going forward. Mm -hmm. To learn this lesson, to kind of give a voice to Eugene and the many Eugenes that have passed in the last 100 years, you as a historian have personally curated uh, exhibitions around the Eugene story. What do you think about a, cor a choir uh, singing about mm -hmm. Eugene's story and trying to tell his story this way? Oh, I think it's wonderful. I think any way we can uh, teach history um, is invaluable because people need a clear understanding of the past to help them actualize their present and the future. And so anytime we can reach a historical story with a new audience through a new medium, be it singing, be it documentaries, be it poems, be it uh, technology with augmented virtual reality and in the World Wide Web, I really think those things are powerful um, tools to teach people um, the history that they need to know again to actualize their present and their futures. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Hi, I'm Flannery Cunningham. Makadidi Mose, I'm Tanyara Tskwatawengwa. 
And we are two composers, collaborators, and friends who are the creators of this choral work for Grace Chorale of Brooklyn and Apollo Chorus of Chicago. So we began this collaboration in 2018 in response to a call uh, by the Grace Chorale of Brooklyn for a co-composer team to um, create a piece that commemorates the centennial of the Red Summer of 1919. And so Flannery and I came together and we decided to tell the story of Eugene Williams. So the piece that you will hear this evening is a sort of distillation of that original piece written for Grace Chorale. And it, we hope it gets to the heart of Eugene's you know, really difficult, uh, emotional, but we think really powerful story um, by sort of condensing the original 35 or so minute piece into a 10 minute piece that um, sort of evokes 1919 Chicago, tells the story of Eugene's death in the waters of the lake, and then um, has a sort of suspension of time and a kind of collective assumption of responsibility where we all sort of together as singers, as listeners, take on the idea that we all, we all bear some responsibility for Eugene's death and in so doing hope to sort of give him some rest. Mm -hmm. And this last movement and this idea of collective assumption of responsibility is very much inspired by uh, my cultural practice. I am from Zimbabwe and I grew up in a Chiwanu cultural tradition. And in Muchiwanu Chedu, in our Chiwanu tradition, if somebody is murdered or killed in an unpleasant way, their spirit cannot cross over to Nyikadzimu, which is the ancestral realm, and their spirit is doomed to wander listlessly uh, throughout kind of stuck in the earth and um, can also cause a lot of trouble and unrest in the area in which they were killed. And people would call that spirit Ngozi. So in order to put that spirit to peace, to appease that spirit so that that spirit can rest, there's a ceremony called Kuripa. And what Kuripa entails is that somebody takes accountability for the wrong that was done. And when that is, when that happens, you know, the community comes together, sings songs, asking for forgiveness from this spirit, taking accountability, and then urging that spirit to finally rest. So that is, you know, the last um, movement, which we call Kuzoro Zwakwa Eugene which means Eugene is finally laid to rest. So we hope that you will sort of join us on this journey of laying Eugene to rest. You'll hear a sort of opening evocation of the heat of Chicago in the summer of 1919. It was a very hot summer. So you'll hear the string quartet sort of evoking that tension and that heat um, under the choral texture. You'll hear poems by our wonderful collaborative poet, Angel C. Dye, who worked with us on the original piece and has been kind enough to read her poetry for this version of the piece. You'll hear a central section that incorporates some humming and some other kinds of sounds to help tell the story of Eugene's passing. And then you'll hear this final movement that Tanya Radzwa has described. So we hope that you will really, you know, be open hearted as you listen to this piece. Of course, when we were composing it in 2018 and performing it in 2019, uh, and then, you know, we've had another performance in 2020 and now in 2021, it's obvious and goes without saying that the events in the material in this piece are very much still relevant today. And so that is also something we wish to speak upon, right? Is just the reality of police brutality, of black death, of racism in this country. And that as we look at this hundred year timeline, we should all be finding ways in which, you know, to, to reckon with this reality that this is still happening. Yeah. And what are the ways in which we as a living community today will, you know, take responsibility for the future for the present and the future to make sure that the future that we have and the present that we have is one in which all these spirits <laughs> that are still going through these terrible murders and death can also find rest. Yeah, yeah. so mm -hmm. we hope you will, you will join us on that 
journey, which is a difficult one, but we, we thank you for your time and your open hearts, as Tanya Radzwa has said, and we hope that you enjoy the piece. Thank you so much. Enjoy. Thank you. The spark. A crimson pulse throbs, same as the blazing sun above. Swelter and steam, burning summer heat. Inferno is imminent. Black bodies baptize themselves at a beach without welcome, ignite without invitation. Inferno is imminent. Let he who is without sin cast it and the stones throw in gulfs, turns Michigan's flow to lapping flames. Martyred Eugene, ripped from his raft, strikes the match's red rage. Inferno was imminent. Blinding smoke raises infuriated stakes. Thick cloud envelops what the lake couldn't wash away. The pain, the burn, the blaze, scorching the finish line in this race. Inferno could not wait. It was a hard, it was a hard, it was a hard summer. No relief, 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 no no July 17th, 1919. A boy named Eugene left his house to meet his friends. They were headed to their private place where only they would go. Their own secret beach between 25th and 29th, black and white. They left their clothes on the sand they pulled their raft from its hiding place and slipped into the waves, holding, kicking, pushing out away from shore. They swam, they dove, they splashed, they played. But the waves were strong and they drifted, drifted towards 29th Street. And then, suddenly, a different splash. A stone thrown from the beach, one and then another. Soon, a pale and angry crowd was throwing rocks and bricks, and the waters turned white where they crashed into the waves. Stones fell heavy and hateful. One stone fell just as Eugene came up for air. It struck him hard and his grip went slack. His head fell sideways and slipped beneath the waves. He sank slowly, so slowly, his arms outstretched. The stones kept falling around him as the water poured down his throat. As he drifted into the dark.
ascension. There is a point within the struggle when a part stands in for the whole, carries its own name and everything moving alongside it into the unknown. Eugene became that symbol and beacon, the inciting innocence igniting the language of the unheard. In his ascension, the prayers and cries of a people rise high as the listening skies. Sable, fury, and alabaster fear remain here, lamenting the glimpse of hope Eugene has found. We send him on now to that resting place flowered in a peace this earth could not cultivate in time. Rest, Eugene, in the liberty of a new life where you are breathed and remembered, honored and enshrined. Lest your exodus be in vain, while we remain here, we must keep trying.